and okay uh, it is with great respect and solidarity in the struggle against colonialism that I acknowledge my presence in the Lenape Hokong, the ancestral lands of the Lenape. As a displaced person of color and a visitor, I pay my respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives, past, present, and emerging, as well as to the indigenous land, water, air, non-human, and human beings. Um, welcome everyone to the Q&A and the workshop for Not Just Roads. The workshop is sponsored by the Unlearning the Urban Seminar at Syracuse University, organized by Timur Hammond in the Department of Geography, Geography and myself, Lawrence Chua, in the School of Architecture. It is co-sponsored by the School of Architecture and the Department of Art and Music Histories. I am really delighted to introduce you to Nitin Batla and Kliarhos uh, Papinok. Papa Nicolau, uh, the directors, writers, and producers of Not Just Roads, which we had the pleasure of watching on Tuesday night. Nitin Batla is a lecturer and postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Architecture at the ETH in Zurich, where he coordinates the doctoral program at the Institute of Landscape and Urban Studies. He also lectures on urban studies, political ecology, and sociology, and work as part and as part of the transdisciplinary project on agro-urbanisms at the Chair of Sociology. His research practice actively combines academic research with artistic practices of filmmaking and socially engaged art. Uh, Claire Jose Eduardo Papino Calao is a filmmaker and researcher born in Mexico City and raised in Chile and the United States. He holds degrees in philosophy and English literature from the University of Sussex, a degree in sociology from the London School of Economics uh, and political science and has studied filmmaking in Denmark at the European Film College. He specializes in urban and sensory ethnographic filmmaking. Before working with Nitin on Not Just Roads, Kliarhos made two films about uh, contested urban spaces in London, The Seven Sisters Indoor Market in 2016 with Marius Klef Kleftakis, and The Disappearance of Robin Hood on the Robin Hood Housing Estate in 2018 with Urban Think Tank. He is also currently based in Zurich, where he teaches ethnographic filmmaking at the urban scale of uh, at the ETH. Um, welcome. Um, I wanted to begin by asking uh, you, Claire Hoss uh, and Nitin, how your collaboration began. Uh, Claire Hoss, you're a filmmaker and researcher, and Nitin, you're a designer and researcher. Um, can I ask you how did you how did you come to work together on this film? Can I just first say thank you, Lawrence, and thank you to all the students who are here. It's really an honor to be talking to you and talk, talking to so many of you. At first, we imagined to have a, a seminar where we would maybe engage a little bit individually, and it's great to be able to see all your faces, but now it seems we're more in a lecture mode. So we'll try to do a kind of a, a hybrid way of relating to all of you and answering these questions. But thanks, can... thanks, for, thanks for inviting, Lawrence. Uh, really a um, uh, pleasure. To join. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, Clarissa and I, we met uh, a couple of years ago when I was starting my PhD here at the ETH. And Clarissa had just moved from London to Zurich um, and he was starting a new job here at uh, the Department of Architecture. And it was a course that uh, Clarissa ran on ethnographic filmmaking. And I was interested in exploring that uh, during my PhD um, to, to make a film. And the PhD looked quite different back then. Uh, it was really like the starting point of the PhD. And I think Clarice and I, we were mutually one of the first people we met uh, and, and we started to watch films together. And I mean, I, I learned filmmaking through Clarice. So it was uh, more like a, a student teacher, but like more like friends kind of uh, relationship that emerged. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I can start answering the question by referring a little bit to this background uh, from my side, um, having studied filmmaking and social science, sociology back to back. And uh, the anecdote that I like to say is that at film school, my peers were making beautiful, amazing uh, looking films, but they, they didn't have so much to talk about. And when I went to uh, study sociology, it was the reverse. People had really vital things to, um, to research and to say, but beyond the traditional academic uh, written piece, 
there was a, a struggle to, uh, you know, to know how to express yourself. And so that was the starting point of my journey in ethnographic filmmaking. And the context in which Nitin and I met was at a point in which I was talking about film, not as something that requires uh, a huge budget or a film crew or what have you. A lot of people watch films and they, they might ask themselves, well, how do you even do that? What is even the first starting point? Was I, what I was telling the students at the time, it's that it's not so much the money that you have or the equipment that you have, but how you use it. And actually we have incredibly sophisticated tools that you can make really powerful films even on your phones. You just need to learn how to use your phones in uh, a way that's effective and powerful. Uh, so this is the context in which Nitin and I met. As, as Lawrence mentioned, of course, uh, Nitin uh, uh, is also a, a, a scholar and um, his topic is contested urbanization, a topic which I knew a little bit less about. So by the time that uh, the idea to do not just roads came about. Nitin was in his PhD research, uh, and we were discussing uh, some of the material and some of the experiences that he was accumulating. And I think formally our project uh, began when Nitin came back to me with an image of a wrestling uh, event. The one you have on the uh, poster for the event um, with the red uh, underwear this wrestler wearing this red underwear. Yeah, and we could maybe come back to this image because I think it's representative of what we're going to be talking about later in terms of not just thick description, what's in an image, what's in a field site, what's in the image that you could capture within a field site, and how do you translate that into a film which tries to uh, evoke the experiences in the field to viewers, um, uh, people that watch it. Uh, later. So when I saw that image, um, I understood that actually this is a, a really rich place in, in, for embarking on, on a longer project. Uh, what the scope of that project was unclear to us at the time, what it was ultimately going to be about, how long it was going to be, a lot of details were unclear at the time. But as we'll explain to you later, because of the ethnographic uh, process in which we took this film uh, undertook this film, uh, this was okay. We could actually begin with a single image and grow it from, from there. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what continued was a sort of iterative process of shooting and editing from the field site in the outskirts of Delhi in India where uh, when Nitin was doing his field work and the editing room, which was actually right in this room, uh, I edited the computer, uh, the, the film right on this computer that we're talking to you from uh, right now, which mm -hmm. is uh, kind of special. <laughs> um, and we'll talk again a little bit more about this iterative yeah. process, yeah. Uh, but that's actually how the film came together slowly uh, from 2019 uh, up to 2020, when the pandemic was kind of stopping everything at our heels, uh, the filming was done and we could take a little bit of time to reflect on it and and take uh, take the edit forward. Uh, in between, there were a lot of other things that we'll talk about. Um, I think in subsequent questions. Mm -hmm. um, thanks. I'm I'm really. I think the thing that really interests me about this film and about your practice is how you use ethnographic filmmaking as as a research tool. Um, and you've written about the ethnographic film as a means to reframe the urban built environment through dwelling on the liminal experiences of the communities that inhabit some of these contested spaces. And I guess for Claire Host, this also extends to your the two short films that you did in London. Um, but one of the things that Not Just Roads really brought up for me was the potential of film as a research tool specifically for designers. Um, and I know you've both written about this before. And I wonder if you could speak to the importance of the liminal that is of occupying positions on both sides of a threshold in your work. Um, because I see Not Just Roads as a film that moves away from the expository um, to the observational and the sensorial, that it's a film that really asks us as viewers, not just to engage with space in this atmospheric or ambient way, but to understand it from the perspective of multiple actors, both human and non-human. And I'm thinking in particular of that scene with the herd of cows where you mount a camera, I, I'm guessing here, that you mounted a GoPro on one of the cows. 
And, you know, there are a lot of other unusual shots that really um, kind of jolt the viewer out of like this expectation of what the landscape looks like, right? That really frame the landscape in this thoughtful and provocative way, you know, turning it on its side, upside down. Um, so yeah, if you could maybe just um, uh, comment on the, the importance of the liminal for you. Yeah, I mean, um, so uh, like I, I, I was doing ethnographic research um, and I mean, um, at one point, so since 2017, and then at one point, filmmaking became a part of this research process. Um, but like in our, our, our um, um, further work that uh, Clarice and I are doing, um, developing thinking about film and spatiality of film, uh, we feel it's also um, a sort of tool of practice, tool of architecture and practice, you know. So, um, like, um, traditionally in modernity, like how we've practiced architecture, we've sort of really detached uh, the lived space with the represented, repre represented space and the conceived space, to use Lefebvre's uh, triad, um, so to speak. And ethnographic film somehow brings these worlds together in, in uh, a unity again, uh, where somehow the, uh, the lived experiences become merged into the uh, conceived and the represented spaces. So, so that, that was uh, somehow while, while experiencing with uh, Kleros um, on how to make an ethnographic film because I'm not a filmmaker. Uh, I, I somehow felt that it, it's, it's not just a tool for research, but also architectural practice. You know, now with all these sort of uh, questions around degrowth and um, perhaps like, you know, what, what can be the future of architectural practice and climate breakdown? Uh, this, this sort of question becomes uh, more and more important to, to, to find other ways of practicing as architects. And um, uh, the experience of liminality and making ethnographic film uh, has been one of the ways in which uh, I've tried to, for myself, as someone who studied architecture, um, uh, sort of um, a way of answering this conundrum or, you know, sort of uh, thinking about lived experiences. Yeah. yeah. I think liminality is a really key word um, for the whole project, both in front and behind the camera. And... Um, I mean, in front of the camera, actually, what you see is a liminal space. You know, we talked about it in the early days of the film as a Tehran vague. You weren't really sure what the thresholds were, where things began or ended. And I think the film tries to also creatively interpret this liminal space. Um, so there's liminality very much in front of the camera. Behind the camera, um, there's a disciplinary, very interesting disciplinary liminality that Nitin was, was getting at here. I mean, from my side, for example, as somebody with film, film training, specifically for filmmaking at the architecture department, I find myself in very liminal situations all the time, but they're very productive in the sense that the conversations that I have with my colleagues who are uh, architects or urban designers or planners, well, we come at those questions from different perspectives and we have different references. And we, we, when we try to make sense of, out of the very different types of references that we have, we come up with something else, something new. So there's a tension here, but it's a productive tension. And I think making this film with the support of uh, various entities, among which in some sense is also our department, and then screening it back to architecture departments like this one, I think you know, there, there's an attempt to speak a language that's intelligible, that's familiar, both in terms of topics, and in terms of aesthetics, but also there's a defamiliarization that is intended to take place so that you continue the inquiry, so that you're never entirely uh, sort of couched in a certainty of what exactly it is that you think is going on. Because as, as soon as you realize, uh, as soon as you make up your mind about what you think is happening, there's something that ends, something really important. And that's where a lot of knowledge is actually produced in uh, these liminal spaces. So I think for us, liminality is a really key concept. Uh, also going forward, I mean, Nitin mentioned, you know, our, our current work. We recently had a, a conference that uh, Nitin especially was one of the main organizers in our department called 
film, architecture, and urban studies. And for those of us that have been teaching filmmaking in various ways at the department, it was a really great opportunity to uh, disentangle some of these tensions, not to resolve them because that would defeat the purpose, but to disentangle them, to understand them better. And uh, there was a question of um, service. Uh, are we uh, working with film in the service of architecture? Is architecture in the service of film? And actually going through these discussions made us realize that there's actually a third thing that happens mm -hmm. in, uh, as a result of these liminal uh, relations that sometimes you actually create something that is deeply architecturally uh, architectural, deeply urban, mm -hmm. but also it speaks other languages. And those other languages are precisely, I think, what the film tries to, well, innovate with and how it kind of projects itself to even more uh, publics. Thanks. I just wanted to remind our workshop participants that they're welcome to put their questions in the chat. Um, I just have a few more questions and then we can open up the floor, but um, this would be a good time to, to start formulating your questions. Um, you, you've, uh, you've, you've kind of responded to this in a more um, general way, but I, I wanted to ask you more specifically what you think architecture and design practice in general have to learn from ethnography and specifically from ethnographic film um, because it occurred to me watching not just roads that the kinds of engagement that ethnography demands being embedded within communities for extended period of, periods of time developing relationships protecting your informants is something that i think most good architects really aspire to but never quite manage to pull off um, and I think that ethnographic filmmaking offers, it seems, a way of studying with communities, of learning from them. Um, but I wonder also how one might do that in a non-extractive way, in a way that respects both the temporal limits of both the creative endeavor and the life of the community. I mean, uh, this is a, something that's really fresh to us because uh, Clarice and I, we were a part of this uh, conference, uh, yes, Yesterday, in Neuchatel. Neuchatel. Yes, yes. Just yesterday, we were presenting yesterday. in a conference. It was uh, it was a paper on restitution, ethnographic film, and restitution of knowledge, um, because uh, that's that's a topic that's been very uh, focal um, in in um, thinking about ethnographic film and restitution of it. So people have you know wondered always about oh let's give some VHS copies back to or like DVDs of the film back to the community we worked with. And that's a form of material restitution where people have think, thought about the media in which they should return the film material back and who owns the film, basically, these kind of questions. But um, I think one of the questions that emerged for us is in this sort of ethnography we were doing, and that's somehow also the question we um, encounter as architects today is the question of scale. Uh, the, the scalarity of practice has just exploded. Like, uh, you know, more and more in architecture schools and architecture classrooms, we are um, encountering questions of the territory, metabolism, material extraction, you know. So, and then how do you study those ethnographically? And how do you make films of them? And then how, what kind of knowledge restitution practices does that entail? Because you're not dealing with one community in particular, but you're dealing with the fragmentation of everyday lives through uh, practices of imperialism, uh, capitalism, um, all kinds of violence, you know, um, gendered violence, and, but all kinds of other types of uh, violent forms. And how, how do you sort of, you know, even restitute knowledge there? And what we what we did with Claros is um, with this same team we had in, in the film project, we did a public art project where we took materials from the film and we actually recreated one of these, uh, uh, you know, kiosks, the real estate kiosks, which tries to sell back um, um, uh, real estate to people and people come and visit it, but then, you know, there's something else inside. It's it's completely subverting the form of real estate sale. And in, in our uh, head or in our um, understanding, that was a form of restitution of knowledge or non-extraction, you know, because in, in this sort of um, what's happening in Delhi or perhaps in many <laughs> places around the world is 
the, the, there's a lot of people who are complacent in it. You know, the the everyone in the film except for the pastoralists are complicit in in the in in the practice uh, of what's happening in the territory. So so that that was our response to it. Yeah, I mean another another angle to this to this question. Um, um, yeah. No, I, I, I was just thinking of an answer and it's, it's kind of uh, escaping my mind. Ah, yes. Um, you know, it occurs to me that uh, a lot of you are going to become architects, uh, aren't you? And so it's, it's uh, I think, a really good moment, perhaps in your trajectory, to understand that when you become architects, you might find yourself in a kind of a paradoxical situation because uh, the, the commercial sort of realities of practicing architecture in the economic system in which we live will require you to have projects, have time scales, uh, have uh, basically a very narrow window in which to dream up and execute your project. And there's often something missing in order to do it effectively. Because in order to do it effectively, you, there has to be some form of understanding of the context, that there is a, a fitness for purpose of the project that you are working on and the place where it's going to exist and the people that are going to be using it. Um, and how do you how do you do that? And this is, I think, where the ethnographer is especially an apt person to inform the practices of the architect. I mean, in the best case, the architect has absorbed some uh, lessons of ethnography in their practice in whatever window of time that they have to understand the 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 scale, as Nathan said, the dimension and the use uh, that those projects are going to have, whether they're uh, built environment, landscape, uh, whatever. So um, it's a type of a sensibility of how the world works, rather than, uh, which I think is sadly the, the mindset of many architects, I have a project, I'm going to execute it, and uh, when it's done, I'm going to leave because that was my role. But there's a, there's a wider sense of uh, responsibility uh, there, and uh, sometimes the uh, profession itself doesn't prompt you. It's rather during your studies, uh, in research contexts at university or at universities, that we really uh, talk a little bit further about that um, issue. But uh, you're gonna you're gonna deal with it, whether you realize it or not. When it is that you get, if you get into practice, so um, it's about understanding context, being a participant observer, and. Uh, imagining, being able to imagine the implications of your work, because no matter what, there will be implications, whether you recognize them or not. Um, we, we spoke about this a, a little bit before, but um, in a way, the film really touches on a subject that's not necessarily new, and it's certainly not unique to India or really any other part of the world. Um, as as the end of as the end credits of of not just roads suggest, um, I, I guess I wanted to ask you two questions here. One, were you conscious of the ways that the conditions of the Bharat Mala were similar to conditions of infrastructure development across the global south when you began the project? And also, you know, to to go back to the formal aspects of the film, which I think are really what's truly innovative about Not Just Roads, you know, it really seems to be very self-consciously speaking in a language of filmmaking in the global south. Um, you know, I'm thinking of like the work of, of filmmakers like Apichapong, Wira Setukun, um, you know, or, um, you know, even, even American directors like Arthur Jaffa. Um, but it, it really seemed like this very self-conscious, effort to break away from older conventions of, of narration. Um, so I wonder if you could maybe respond to that. Um, I mean, uh, the I, I will just take on the first part of the question, perhaps. Um, and um, OK, I mean, I was reading a little bit about it. Uh, and I, I've written about it in Architecture, Architecture Review. And there's now a, a long book chapter that's coming out in a book on extended organization. Um, I mean, the, the, the question of infrastructure and uh, state making is not just limited to the global south. Uh, uh, the idea of state space of the US was invented through the US interstate system, you know, and the, the, this 
couple of really nice books. There's one called The Car Country, which talks about uh, the uh, the production of the U.S. United States um, through car and through the motorway system. There's the uh, Mole, um, Robert Mole book on um, um, on the U.S. interstate system, on how state space is produced and uh, the film, in a sense, and in, in my research, uh, one of the major chapter looks at uh, this uh, sort of contradiction in state making. No, so the 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 tagline of the Bharat Mala project is not just roads, building a nation, and it's actually building a nation. It's building a new state space, which is uh, on the explosion of the colonial state space, which was really premised on the Indian railway system, and now this what this um, spreading of urban corridors everywhere it does is it allows to enclose land, it uh, allows to um, spread uh, a new kind of social relation relations in all over the territory, which are very urban in that sense. And people like Neil Brenner um, and uh, many, many others in the US have written about it at the Harvard GST, for example, or at, at, at um, now at Chicago, uh, in, at the University of Chicago as well. So, I mean, that's, that's a question that also is uh, uh, being sort of, you know, tackled and, and being answered in the film uh, and in sort of uh, conversation with people working on the One Belt, One Road project, for example, or, you know, all these contemporary projects of urban corridors. So that, that uh, um, a consciousness around that definitely existed, but uh, the film, I would say, allowed... Um, something else to emerge, like, you know, um, uh, for, for me to be more attendant to the processes that, that are integral to it. Um, yeah. I can take on the, set, the second question, which was uh, kind of about aesthetics. Um, what, what you end up learning in, in film school, it's that uh, any work, any story that you tell has internal rules. I mean, of course, there's conventions uh, like in Hollywood. Uh, films can be told this way. There's this thing called the hero's journey, which you might have heard of. But the reality is that um, whenever you begin watching something or reading a story, actually the rules of how that story is going to be is going to be told uh, are presented to you by the film that itself. Uh, in the first few minutes, it's going to communicate to you the rhythm that it's going to have. The, the type of cutting, the associative uh, element. Uh, if it's an experimental film, it'll communicate to you that perhaps you're in for something that's gonna be more difficult to interpret. And uh, this is actually something that's uh, a productive thing to, to think about in terms of how to begin telling your story because it, it puts you in a position where you know that you have to establish these rules, not that you begin blindly and rules are established, but you're not in control of them. And in that sense, it's important to have a really good sense of what you're doing. And this goes back a little bit to the question of architect, to the disciplinary question, architecture, filmmaking, et cetera, what's in the service of what? I mean, in the best case, one is able to learn about something for itself in the best way, not in service of something else. Because if you do that, you might have a, a more superficial understanding. And so going back to not just roads, we of course have a lot of overlapping uh, overlap in our work. Uh, but of course, I, I um, you know, have this very aesthetic filmmaking background. And so I, I've watched a lot of films, you know, just like when you read a lot, you get a sense of how you might write, you, you develop your voice. Um, over the course of a long time by watching enough films, um, you know, I developed a, a sense of, of aesthetic that then I kind of put on the table and we negotiated with, with Nitin and we created our, our own voice. And that's very intentional. Those sets of rules and aesthetics that we set out are very in, intentional. And uh, earlier uh, we spoke a little bit about the translation from the audiovisual data, what you actually film, and what you end up seeing in the final film, you know, this edited work that goes through various filters. Something happens in the process, which is actually about uh, properly evoking what it is that you feel. And uh, the thing that you film is only one element of it. There's many more elements, and some of them are associative. And so uh, this is why the film 
looks in the way that it does. And it very intentionally tries to uh, borrow from the language of cinema because cinema is something that is full of tools to evoke, to uh, have affect, to create uh, an emotional response. And we can talk a little bit more about affect and knowledge derived from empathy uh, a little bit uh, later, as opposed, uh, you know, how this kind of relates to the more traditional scientific knowledge. You know, this is also a productive tension uh, to continue talking about later. Um, thanks. I, you've been very generous with with questions. Um, I, I just wanted to remind our, our participants that um, you're welcome to uh, pose a question to Claire Hoss and, and Nitin uh, by just dropping in, dropping it in the chat. Um, uh, we have one simple question. question. Sorry. Question. Well, sorry, Lawrence, to interrupt. I just wanted to say, even simple questions, things you were wondering, they, they're often triggers for for uh, bigger lines of inquiry. Sorry. Um, no, no, no. That it's that's yeah, very generous of you. Uh, great to point out. Um, we have one question, and then I have a, a question. But um, uh, the question that comes from uh, our participant Morgan uh, Renon is um, I spent this past summer in Rwanda where similar issues surrounding roads accessed and an emerging master plan exist. I experienced the difficulty of getting from place to place in the absence of paved roads, privileged to be driving an all wheel drive vehicle while many Rwandans travel by foot or bicycle. The film seems to critique the construction of roads alongside poor or unrealized urban planning. However, one of the people you interviewed, um, I think he was an engineer or construction manager for the construction, emphasized how the roads are for everyone and roads provide access. I'm curious if you have taken a strong position one way or the other on whether the roads are good or bad and if the film is meant to take a strong position one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, uh, we learned a lot through the protagonist. Excellent question. Excellent question. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I mean, we learned a lot through the protagonist. There's also this guy at the wrestling match who talks about, oh yeah, the city came, it brought a lot of problems, but it's also brought a lot of money. So everything is fine overall. And uh, there's this protagonist who's like, yeah, we know, you know, they, these roads are being built to build those towers at the back, but then in, in the end, like we all have access to it. I mean, there's some sort of double-edgedness to urbanization that always exists. Um, I mean, of course, the the central point around building of these uh, highways and urban corridors is to enclose land, to enclose agricultural land. And, you know, as soon as you put a road, the rent ground rents go 20 times higher. No, So agricultural land, uh, the, the price increases and you can sell and you can you can buy that land and you can trade it in financial markets. Right. So that's one intention to build these roads. But then it's always an contradictory and incomplete pro project, which uh, allows it to be made into something else. And I think that that's what the ethnographic, that's the work ethnographic film does. And that's what the protagonists tell us as well. Hey, the, these roads have come, but we can make something else out of it. So uh, that would be my long winded answer to that question. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you, you, you touch on the same topic of liminality here because it's not a question of good or bad here it's a much more complex field that has to do with the development you know global development you know um india is a country that is having an economic growth spurt and like many other uh countries over the year it, it wants to develop for you know for for the aspiration of all of the the the, the the riches of capitalism, all, all those riches that capitalism promises, which in Europe and in the United States and other highly developed countries, you know, we, we have reaped those benefits in full. And at times uh, um, uh, through through the uh, exploitation of, of countries like India. And so there is that tension that uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's certainly not that uh, development shouldn't take place. And I think this uh, even this line is also echoed by uh, one of the characters who's a who's a, a, conserva a conservationist who who says, "Okay, let there be real estate development, let there be the urbanization of cities, but we need to have a handle on how these things happen." Of course, when you talk about uh, late capitalism, neoliberal financial capitalism, 
uh, the, the scope of being able to handle how those things happen is a little bit more complex. And we somehow try to convey that in the film as well. But I think those key moments, the, the, the scene I just referenced, or, or the farmer who says, well, as a farmer, I'm devastated, but there's also good things that come. These are some of the key moments in the film that try to convey this tension of which there's no easy answer, uh, but trying to understand uh, the somehow overlapping and sometimes contradictory forces is in a way what the film tries to shine a light on. We, we had another um, question from a participant uh, from Claire uh, Urbas. Was there a lot of experimentation when deciding on unique ways to use or mount the cameras? What, what, what made you decide on what angle or view was most adequate? Again, another, thank you for the question, very, very good question. Another uh, point of tension, because in, in, in the best case, you're trying to, um, as we said earlier, translate an experience you had in the field with others, translate perhaps relations that you had, which are mutual, you know, they're bilateral. And how are you able to translate a relation that, a relation that you had with a person or a more than human entity in the field into your film? So this is difficult to find a way to have a, a multiplicity of perspectives and uh, reflections of relations in a way that also is aesthetically uh, flowing. And uh, the best thing that we can do is to make experiments. So one of them, for example, is to use the GoPro and we're in, of course inspired by other uh, ethnographic filmmakers, for example, from the sensory ethnography lab, you know, this trick of the using a GoPro to add authorship to an object or uh, an animal or a more than human entity comes from films like Leviathan from 2011 and, and so on. So this was a very clear picking up on, on, on that uh, sort of trick. Um, uh, and it's not, it's not um, in a way mimicking what they see. Like, you know, we, we're not able to see exactly like the non-human, but uh, this experimentation allows us to see something that's unseen usually. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a mechanical eye in that sense, you know, it's still a mechanical eye. This is a, maybe a great moment to just share with you uh, an anecdote about one of the scenes in the film, which was towards the end of the film. It's raining and there is a car that traverses the frame and then two boys appear paddling uh, and then they leave and then a car comes back. Do you, do you remember? You can nod your head. Do you remember the scene? Yes, I see some nodding heads. So actually, uh, if you look at the raw footage of that scene, all of those things are happening simultaneously. The boys are in the water, the car is going back and forth. Uh, but there was something about the scene that uh, was very powerful. And so in order to convey that power, we did an experiment and uh, through you know, various tricks of editing, which we can go into if you like, we basically um, you know, uh, layered the, the shot over itself enough times and in such a way that we could separate the actions. The car would go in first, then the boys would appear and leave. And then the car would reappear as if chasing them. Uh, you see? Uh, in a way, this is not what happened, but it is faithful to this kind of uh, experience of, of, a, of, a, of a type of flight and um, liminality and um, somehow the, the scale of the distances, you know, two boys just uh, swimming in a lake uh, that's made by the overflow of the rainwater. All of this seemed to be better expressed by extending the scene in this way, but we had to, so to speak, tell a lie in order to tell it in this way. So this is, yeah, one of the experiments that, that we took on. This is one of many examples of how we tried to close our eyes and go back to what was experienced in the field and what the, 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 the footage expresses if it doesn't always clearly do so in its raw format. Um, we had one more question uh, from the audience that just came in um, from Han Song Ding. Uh, I'm doing a street interview channel about the life of international students and cultural differences between China and the United States. Oh, 
that's great because you're perfectly situated for the for this exercise today. Um, when I'm doing it, he says, I find that in many cases, the interviewer results tend to be homogenized, but the topics that are widely discussed tend to be gener general or controversial. Cross-cutting is a good way to shoot the genre, but I'm curious about how to mobilize different interview subjects to answer questions with different unique perspectives. Hmm. Well, I think as, as Lauren said, we have a whole exercise for you that basically revolves around this question. So uh, I suppose the only thing to do now is maybe just to frame uh, that further discussion that we'll have, because we'll really go at length about how actually you can conduct an, an interview um, and an interview that focuses on the, the ultimately very different uh, set of phenomena that you can find in an interview situation that surrounds the actual question and answer itself. How do you go beyond the question and answer and to really look at the more holistic expanded field of things that are happening and actually being expressed. Um, so I just want to frame that we're going to be doing that. Um, and uh, we're not so much going to be talking about editing because you mentioned cross cutting as a good way to shoot the genre, but maybe we'll give some hints about how, uh, and maybe we're already doing so in terms of talking about um, editing as a way of translating an experience that's evoked in the field. So uh, cross cutting here would be maybe uh, making sense insofar as there's associations they would like to create uh, and whether those associations are what people actually literally say, or perhaps it's how they say it, or perhaps there's other things that might connect different interviews that would justify the cross-cutting. This, this is something that uh, we can talk about a bit later. Um, so hold tight, hold tight for, for a bigger answer. And I also see there's even more questions. Yeah, so one more question from Alex Musal and then I've got a question to wrap this up. Um, uh, Alex asked, I grew up in an East African country that has that has seen similar infrastructure development over the latter half of the past decade. Uh, they are having similar discussions with regards to how and where to develop and the obvious conflict of what are we destroying by developing in a given location. However, such discussions and conflicts are not easy to see from the ground level. I found that most of the people in the country didn't see this infrastructure from the big picture conflict that is going on. So my question is, how do we as active participant society, as the architect usually is, although, yeah, that's up for debate, view our work from a big picture standpoint in relation to its intimate act impact on the members of the community? Or in a different way, where is the compromise between a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach in the development of society and or the work of an architect? I think this is maybe your um, what should we do question, Pierre Hoss? <laughs> no, I think, uh, the, I mean, this is a question that Clarice and I, we've been uh, tackling through a paper paper we are developing and we had a, um, we had a talk uh, recently at the University of uh, Bern uh, around this topic where we, we called it the urban sensorium, the ethnographic film and the urban sensorium. And um, we were talking about how, uh, I mean, you, you have a, Alex, you, you observe very correctly. Um, sometimes in the heat and dust of everyday life, you don't, um, don't understand the totality of social relations, right? Like this, what you're calling as a big picture. Uh, and uh, us as academics or architects who are privileged in, in some senses, no? like we, we should try to stretch um, our posi positions as undercommons. Um, um, and I, I'm sure in the US, that's a very famous book now, you know, Undercommons and to talk about Undercommons. Um, and uh, to, to, to sort of, you know, to share, to share this big picture uh, image uh, um, in, in a way that is accessible to people. So usually that has been, the register has been, you know, magazine, journal articles, uh, books and everything. Not everyone reads that. Um, and usually what, what I find through this collaboration with Clarice is that uh, films become a very effective tool, you know, in order to convey that big picture argument or, you know, this sort of urban sensorium, to share the urban sensorium and trigger policy changes and other sort of architectonic changes as well. Yeah, um, thanks for all these questions. They're really great and, and thought provoking. 
I mean, I think uh, here there's a question of, I mean, there's, there's I think, some assumptions that we need to disentangle in order to get to the bottom of this question, uh, because what do we mean by active members of society? It, uh, I mean, I wonder whether there's an implication that, um, you know, everyone should have a big picture perspective, a kind of overview, but this is actually a very privileged perspective uh, that, uh, to, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that we can assume that everybody uh, either can or even wants, or perhaps even should see uh, society in, in, this, in this way, uh, because it's a somehow a totalizing way. It's a kind of uh, a particular stream of looking at how the world works, whereas there are an infinity of life worlds that we're dealing with, and some of them are actually more than human. And it, there, therefore, it's a question of scale. I mean, I would I would be tempted to extend your question to, uh, you know, the plants and the cats, the dogs, and you know, what's their active role in the society? And um, I think what what uh, with this film we're perhaps trying to convey, and we can put on different hats. But I think from the perspective perspective of this film, what we would try to do is to encourage a certain type of sensibility, a sensibility that tries to absorb. Uh, well, first of all, understand different life worlds. And some of those life worlds that maybe are not active participants of what it is that's happening. Um, and to, to this, we, we would uh, also include all, all of those more than human entities. It's also a class question. Um, and uh, when, we, when we go deeper into the question, what we certainly should, you know, in, in terms of the bigger picture question, what should we do? Uh, at the very least, we should not create obstacles for others to participate. We should not create hindrances for others to participate. We should rather try to build bridges. And so insofar as we're trying to create uh, strategies for sensibiliza sensibilization, perhaps some of those strategies can also build bridges to uh, you know, real direct political participation. And in that sense, our film can be read in an activistic sense, although it doesn't lead from that point of view. Um, so yeah, basically do no harm. Um, I, I, we're, we're coming up on time. Um, and I just want to make sure we have time for to, to have a bio break and attend to our, our physical bodies. Um, but I wanted to maybe roll um, a question from a participant into my last question. Um, uh, so I, I wanted to draw you out finally a bit about the importance of uh, thick description in your work. Um, Gilbert Ryle, the philosopher who's credited with coining the term thick description, used it to describe not just physical behaviors, but their context as interpreted by actors as well, so that it can be more fully understood from an outside perspective. And in the film, there's plenty of thick description. You incorporate a few interviews with human subjects, but it's almost as if the questions are generic, right? As a result, we're left to consider the ways that things are said the ways that things are said and the spatial context in which they're said. And this really had the effect of bringing the viewer into this new, more astute relationship with the built environment in which these interviews happen. So for example, the interview with the agents on the side of the road who are selling condo units. I, I mean, maybe I'm speaking for myself, but I felt that you know one quickly lost interest in what he was actually saying but became much more interest in, interested in both his rote, almost mechanized delivery, and then the place that surrounded him. Um, and Stuti Kurudi has also asked in a similar way, um, it seems like more importance was given to capturing the ambient background noise, causing viewers to depend on subtitles to understand what was being said. Um, and she wanted to know what your intention was behind this decision. Um, could it have had to do with the fact that um, the audience was mainly English speaking? Well, um, we'll talk a little bit about thick description later as well, because it contextualizes the, the interview exercise that uh, we're gonna um, share with you. I mean, the thing about thick description is that it's uh, a perspective that prompts you to look at the 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 really the entire frame and actually also beyond the frame because thick description uh, which we'll try to also uh, define uh, in particular ways later it's 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 about finding what's also under the surface what's also invisible 
not just the small details that might be difficult to parse, but actually the details that are not even visible at all, or not even visible at certain points, but visible in, in others. So, I mean, thinking about this, this last question in, in relation to thick description, I think it, it has also to do with our choices in composition and editing. And I think sound is on the same level. And it's, it's, a, it's about how can we put the viewer in a position not to assume what it is that they should be looking at. Because films often do that. Films in the, in the rules that we said that they create, they indicate to you where you should look. They might put a character or a person in the foreground and they're talking. And by now we're conditioned to really just look at that person. And with, of course, lenses with focal length, uh, maybe the background will be blurred and we have no choice. Here, actually shooting with a focal length that allows the background to still have some detail uh, is often a deliberate choice so that we're able to somehow negotiate what we see in the foreground with what we see in the background, with also what we hear. And also as the description allows us to do also what we might somehow perceive as there, sense is there, but we don't actually see it tangibly. So um, it, it, it does disorient some people especially insofar as uh, we have that conditioning that we think that we should be looking somewhere, but we don't know where to look. But this is, this is an interesting moment of tension because uh, we don't wanna make you lost, but rather we are here to challenge you with uh, the question for yourself, where should I be looking at? And perhaps that will lead you to begin thinking about um, certain things that you wouldn't otherwise have thought about. And this is also what duration does. Um, if you look at something for five seconds, you will have a completely different impression of what it is you're looking at than if you're looking at it for five minutes, right? And this is something that cinema can do. You know, these kind of audiovisual methods, it's a trick up that sleeve. You can't really do that with a, with a writing uh, as easily. Um, so together with the sound, together with the editing, together with the overall aesthetic, we're just trying to sort of create that mode where you have a, different feeling that throws you in different directions. And it's all based around thick description. In other words, seeing things beyond the, the narrow scope of what it is that we're seeing, seeing the bigger picture, and to say it a third time, even what's also not there in the frame. Uh, I mean, I, I just wanted to very quickly add to some uh, to this question, uh, to this response rather. Um, I mean, this this is really interesting book by Jock, uh, John L. Jackson. It's called Thin Description, and uh, you know he he sort of argues that um, when we write about uh, the Jewish experience, we always tend to discount the black black Jews, um, black blackness in Jewish um, history, and uh, that's been a problem a problem with thick description. You know? So he talks about how every thick description is actually thin if you consider who's been left out. And I think what Shruti is alluding to is also the leaving out of this um, guy on the side of the road. To be honest, like, you know, he was really, I mean, uh, he was really having a hard time because every time he would start to explain, it, he would be drowned by these noises. Uh, and, you know, he was trying to sell, he was trying to portray this utopia that was supposed to come. And then the his, the actual materiality of the place doesn't, match it at all like, nobody can imagine that and when we were reviewing this material with Kleros, we felt that you know there was so, there's something else that was happening there which is not just about excluding this person or you know giving him another voice which is um targeted at english-speaking audiences it's not that but it's rather uh sharing his experience you know like of of uh, uh selling um not making so i mean in the end this person is not making so much money uh, he's sort of uh, really um, fighting with all these uh, uh, things happening around him as well. But at the same time, he's a part of the same machine that's sort of transforming or terraforming the territory. So, so we 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 then chose to tell that story in this in this way, which sort of accentuates the noises for sure, as you said uh, rightly pointed, Shruti. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for Tony's question? Because I think it's the, the only one we didn't get to. Uh, sure. 
uh, if you like. Uh, Tony Dai asked, what are some of the considerations when it comes to editing after having captured all the raw footage? What would prompt something that to be included? And would anything exclude a particular clip? Also, how do you decide when to pace in content pieces versus B-roll shots? Yeah, and, and Lawrence, it's just because I read it and I, you know, the answers just came to me. So I wanted Good. to put that out there. And um, thank you for the question. Um, so we said earlier that the actual editing process was iterative. And in that sense, it was, um, you know, diverging from the typical filmmaking uh, experience where you have shooting and then you have post-production and that's where the edit happens. Things were happening simultaneously. So in that sense, the shooting, the riot, uh, the, the, the film, yeah, the, sh the, the shooting uh, and the editing were writing at the same time. So um, we didn't capture all the raw footage we could say until it is that we decided that the filming that the that the that the film was done that the film the edit was complete. There was always a hmm should we go back and continue this uh, or the other line of inquiry. Um, so that's that's the one question and the uh, you know how do we decide to exclude things? Well, this has to do with um, the beginning, middle, and end of the story that we wanted to to choose. And sometimes things, really great scenes had to be cut out. This is what in the film industry they called killing your darlings. If you've ever heard that term, uh, you love the scene. It's just so amazing. But in the overall narrative of art, it doesn't have a place anymore. And you have to make that tragic decision to kill your darlings. And I think it always happens. Uh, so we had to kill a few darlings there. Uh, and I would actually uh, encourage everybody to think because in the last part of the question, uh, how did you decide when to paste the content in, uh, place the, place the content in pieces versus using b-roll uh, it's really interesting this term b-roll which is something that i think in the mode that we're trying to think about uh maybe we're trying to push away even from the notion of of something like a roll or b-roll where you know in the film industry you have a roll just the, the the conversations the main points of action and the b-roll is the filler uh, the cutaways, the details, the, the things that if you need them, let's put them in. You know, we would go on to say that in this kind of ethnographic mode of filmmaking, there's no A role and B role. There's only the role. It's all part of the same role. There's no detail fillers. Maybe they'll be good. Everything has a role to play on the on the highest level, so to say. And this, again, we kind of develop iteratively. Uh, bit by bit. And that also has its role in the kind of wider ethnographic discourse. We'll get to it later as well in the uh, exercise introduction. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much um, for, you know, taking the time to, to field all these questions. You've been really generous and, and thank you for the film. Um, so I mean, you can't hear us, but um, a big virtual round of applause um, to the both of you. Um, and, and, um, I think now would be a good time for us to take a, a 10 minute bio break. So it's 11.07, um, you're welcome to um, participants. Um, you can turn off your cameras, leave them on. When you come back though, please turn them back on. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, meet, we'll meet back here at 11.17, 11, uh, take a moment, take, have, a, have a walk, get some fresh air, cup of coffee, whatever. Cool, we'll, we'll do that too, see you in a few. Okay, see you in a bit, bye-bye.